welcome back to the cutscenes of MGSV. We'll start where we left off with Miller and Snake en route to the Seychelles. It's worth spending some time at the start on Miller himself. Miller swears he'll have his revenge and take back the past that Cypher stole away. And as soon as he mentions the past, we experience a flashback montage of the events of Ground Zeroes. By the time we come to, we're flying over the Indian Ocean. It's here that Miller delivers what may be the most famous monologue from the game. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Every night, I can feel my leg, and my arm, even my fingers. The body I've lost, and the comrades I've lost, won't stop hurting. It's like they're all still there. <laughs> Notice the beautiful subtlety of how the jacket sleeve slips away from him, causing a clenched fist. Miller, throughout this cutscene, seems like a man on fire, a man possessed. His passion and pain crackle with intensity, but there are subtle clues that, far from being strong, Miller is not only physically but psychologically handicapped in this scene, and this we'll see more clearly upon arrival at Mother Base. After Miller's soliloquy about his both literal and metaphorical phantom pain, he grabs your missing arm, which proves that you share his loss. And this is where we hear for the first time the key phrase for the game, Parasite. I'm the one who got caught up with Cypher, a group above nations, even the US. And I was the parasite below, feeding off Zero's power. Miller then confesses feverishly that it was he who parasitically got caught up with Cypher, a group above nations. Miller here, as he describes himself as a parasite who fed on Zero's power, literally, we see, cannot remain stable without using Snake. After we help him up onto the chair, the green diamond dog jacket, yet again, plays tricks on our eyes, making it look as though Miller's missing limb is still there. This green jacket seems to be a visual metaphor for diamond dogs as Miller's drapery, the phantasmic empty adornment that masks his wounds. And notice that the jacket will make a reappearance in the cutscene with Quiet, but I'm getting ahead of myself. What exactly has he been up to over the last nine years, and why? Well, at the end of the game, we'll see Miller's last moments with the real big boss as he entered his coma back in Colombia following the events of Ground Zeroes. And not long after, Miller leaves this hospital, which, according to tapes, we can assume was set up by Zero as an outpost of ciphers. You weren't in hospital long. I had trouble finding you. Where is he? Safe. But in the same state as when you last saw him. Where is Snake? Now, now. Settle down, or I'll have to hang up. <sighs> and then you never hear from me again. Do you understand? I had him moved once he was stabilized. I'm sure it came as quite a shock to you when you woke up. You'll have to forgive me. I told them to stop putting me under. Surely you understand. Specialized medical treatment in places like that can be positively nightmarish. We couldn't have left him there forever. And to be honest, I was entirely comfortable leaving matters in your hands. And if we assume, as I do, that this strongly implies the destruction of Mother Base was carried out by Skullface, under commission by Zero, something I'll discuss some other time, then one of the primary intended results would be what we're seeing here, the separation of Miller from Snake. Zero will use this to manipulate Cause into playing out his role in the events of the Phantom Pain. After Ground Zeroes, Cause will no longer view Zero or Cypher as mere business partners. They'll become his white whale, his reason for living, as he tells us in this scene, to get his revenge. But that still leaves the nine years between the last time we see Miller in Ground Zeroes and the first time we'll see him in the Phantom Pain, 
So what was he doing? Well, this next bit of information is implied by the tapes as well as the final scene. It seems Miller became a totally amoral bastard after the events of Ground Zeroes, deciding to profit off of war and civil struggles around the Third World at all costs, so long as it makes him money and somehow hurts Cypher. Yeah, we were dogs, all right. Slinking around out of Cypher's sight, digging up whatever kind of dirty money we could find. You name it, we did it. You see this? Diamond Docks. Our new home. The phantom of our former selves. It's about our man, Major. He's been making some moves. Miller? Yes, I know. Rhodesia, is it? Yes, and up to his old tricks again. No matter. He'll stumble soon enough. Skullface and Zero will allude to Miller's involvement in Rhodesia, which is a very controversial and awful story I have to be careful to discuss if I don't want to get demonetized. To save some time, Rhodesia was a horribly racist apartheid state that, like its ally, South Africa, refused in the mid to late 20th century to relinquish white minority control. Though at the time, conflicts like these were widely seen only as East-West proxy wars, the Rhodesian Bush War was in fact much more so than a Cold War fight, a race war. And many American expat veterans, disillusioned by Vietnam, flocked to the conflict as mercenaries. Not unlike Miller, I'd assume the implication from the tape is that Miller was somehow involved with Merc outfits like the so-called Crippled Eagles, who gained members thanks to near-constant propaganda in the English-speaking world's leading mercenary magazine, Soldier of Fortune. And if you have doubts as to the relevance of any of this to the Phantom Pain, consider that the basis for the Diamond Dog Hound is a Rhodesian Ridgeback Dog. The very word Rhodesia is enough to conjure all the phantoms of this horrible period to mind. Meanwhile, there are a lot of possible references conjured up by placing the new mother base in the Seychelles, given how mercenaries from South Africa there tried to overthrow the government, most famously in 1981. The leader of this attempted coup was a legendary mercenary, Mike Hoare, who was among the first wave of mercenaries to ever flock to Africa and stir up civil wars there following World War II. And this event is somewhat alluded to by the game's ending timeline, which mentions the best known example of mercenary intervention in the continent, the Congo Crisis of the 1960s. According to a review of Glenn Cross's Dirty War, Rhodesia and Chemical Biological Warfare 1975-1980 by the Journal of Complex Operations, quote, In 1965, the minority white community in the British territory of Rhodesia officially Southern Rhodesia, rejected demands that it transfer political power to the majority black population. By the mid-1970s, white Rhodesians found it increasingly difficult to counter the growing power of native African nationalists fighting the government. As with many insurgencies, the guerrillas lacked the resources to defeat government security forces in direct combat, but Rhodesian forces were stretched too thin to suppress the insurgents, especially once they had established base camps in neighboring countries. Amidst the conflict, Rhodesian military and intelligence services employed what would now be considered chemical and biological agents against the guerrillas, with unknown results." End quote. This frightening context undergirds a lot of the darkness and horrible ethnic strife that we see alluded to throughout the Phantom Pain. Technically, the Seychelles government the mercenaries tried to overthrow was Marxist and white, not African nationalist and black. Its one-party state president, Franz Albert René, is also known on the islands as simply the boss. But the mercs who tried to overthrow the boss back in 1981 did so in coordination with the South African Bureau for State Security, boss, as well, some rumors allege, as the CIA. During this era, it wasn't easy to say for sure where the Cold War's antagonisms ended and nationalist and racial ones began. That's why mercenaries like Miller could make such a killing. It's important to point out we can't say for sure that Miller fought on the Rhodesian side of the Bush War. After all, in the MGS universe, Diamond Dogs were contracted as part of the Seychelles counteroffensive, not by the mercs who attacked. 
It was in exchange for that job, in a logistics and military advisory capacity, that instead of money, the Seychelles government provided Diamond Dogs with what began life as a test drilling rig owned and operated by a mineral resources supplier, now Mother Base. Whether Kaz fought for the Rhodesians or the Zimbabweans, there's no denying that he and Diamond Dogs, then as ever, profit off of racial and tribal violence. The demand for PFs here in Africa is especially high. Cold War standoffs, resource exploitation, tribal clashes. What's big business for developed countries has only brought conflict here. That mess you're standing in is just the latest example. That's how it goes. One country's people is split apart by another country. Then the two groups tear up their own land for money in order to fight each other. Now this civil war started by a foreign power is the norm, and it's sucking up all the country's resources. PFs are just the same. They follow the money, taking war with them wherever they go. That goes for us too. It's an endless river of bloody retaliation, and we're standing downstream. Should we make a stand and staunch the flow? Or wade in amongst the corpses and make a bigger splash than the rest? He really is sick. MGSV does a stunning job of portraying the war economy Miller started as a kind of contagious illness that he willfully spread all over the world. I should mention that even today in modern day Zimbabwe, the races remain divided along linguistic lines. While the first language of most black Zimbabweans is a regional tongue like Chona or Nedebele, for white Zimbabweans as it was during the days of Rhodesia, that first language is still English. Whites and English speakers alike comprise roughly 2.5% of the total population. Now, reasonably, you might be wondering if this topic of racial intolerance and warmongering is so crucial to the Phantom Pain, why then is it so hard to identify? I saw people online when the game came out once wondering why chapter two in the game is named Race. According to them, race and racism were topics that the Phantom Pain never brought up at all. Well, this is a bit too big to go into completely here, but let me just say for now that I'd argue the way the Phantom Pain is constructed serves to somewhat satirize the concept of colorblindness of a post-racial world and other sort of utopian dreams that followed the end of the Cold War. The game's whole point here seems to be that certain truths have been suppressed from our faculties of representation publicly. We just don't see them, in other words, even when they are hiding in plain sight. This is how the injustices and violence perpetuated by the system becomes systemic in the Phantom Pain. They fade like background noise from our notice. They become normalized. They become ignorant of, and so ignored. This will cover more clearly hopefully, when we get to the portion of the game that's set in Central Africa. So for now, let's just hold off on this subject. If Zero and Cypher want to unite a world without borders, it seems Miller strives to create not only a new kind of business, as he told us in Peace Walker, but a new world without nations, a united world beset instead by endless internal strife and international mercenary interventions. We'll unite all private forces under you, transcending nations and economies. What is a nation? Just a patch of dirt. The bonds among us will surpass nations, and that's what'll put the world under our control. To bring us back to this scene in the chopper, a nice musical detail is the steadily growing bass swells as Miller describes Cypher as a mighty monster that, like a rapidly spreading pandemic, just keeps getting bigger. Cypher. Growing, swallowing everything in its path, getting bigger and bigger. Who knows how big now? Boss, I'm gonna make him give back our past, take back everything that we've lost, and I won't rest until we do. Pushing Mother Base. There's then more of the game's exquisite wordplay. Miller declares he's going to make him give back our past, take back everything we've lost, and that he won't rest until we do. Rest here, of course, teases Miller's fate in MGS1. 
As Winston says in George Orwell's 1984, Miller is the dead, a man whose death is all but preordained. The Phantom Pain uses this foreknowledge we have for dramatic irony, one of the oldest rhetorical flourishes in history. As Miller hurdles towards a death that he's blind to see, that he's already, in a sense, made happen. It's here Miller and Snake get close enough to kiss in one of several such scenes in The Phantom Pain. Yet the look on Snake's face is completely, almost comically blank. This is not the same man Miller debatably fell head over heels for nine years before, whether romantically or otherwise. Visually, this moment conveys the futility of Kaz's crusade, that as Skullface tells Zero, some things can't be undone. As Donna Burke will sing in the main theme for the game, Sins of the Father, in my heart I just know that there's no way to light up the dark in his eyes. Kaz, somewhat in denial, is clearly still very weak from his torture and detainment. Drained by this explosion of angst, he slumps back and looks off stage. Then, with the cacophony of the choppers closing in, our new future comes into view. This scene plays with space as a stand-in to some extent for time. What's ahead, literally, is also ahead chronologically. Mother base. All of this exemplifies how the Phantom Pain will play with the richness of both visual and literal language and all its ambiguities, its double meanings. And this, by the way, is part of why I'm just so in love with this game. The mother base platform looks like some striding behemoth. Obviously, its color brings to mind, just as the Caribbean one did, the big shell from MGS2. But an important visual conceit in the Phantom Pain is superstructures under construction. We'll see this again and again as in, say, The Devil's House and OKB0, to just name two locations. But more on this thematic conceit, we'll just have to wait. This scene also establishes an important difference from MGS5 and Peace Walker. Whereas in Peace Walker, Big Boss was really the leader, Diamond Dogs has been active for nine years without him in places like the aforementioned Rhodesia, today known as Zimbabwe. Often we'll see units and portions of the organization we didn't yet know existed. Like these other choppers, for example. Parts of the superstructure we'll never be able to access, and so on. Who are these two other choppers? We can never be sure. This helps bring across the sense in which we are, in Orwell's phrasing, inside the whale something that Kojima has been trying to achieve since at least the Arsenal Gear sequence in MGS2. Inside the whale means we're so deeply inside something, some ideology, some situation, that we can't even see it. And that brings a sort of safety, a security, in the powerlessness. We are, in other words, just a part of a much larger organism, too large to see all at once, a superstructure, a leviathan. This works both literally in terms of Mother Base and Diamond Dogs itself, as well as metaphorically in terms of our unwitting involvement in the real Big Boss's secret plan, which we won't learn until the end of the game. Now, notice that for the entire scene that we've been seeing Snake only in profile and heard only Miller speak. Snake only faces the camera directly at the very start and the very end of this scene, which is when he finally talks. But there are subtle visual details that are actually putting us inside Snake's head all along. Notice as one example the frequent rainbow halo that we see around lights in not only this scene, but the Phantom Pain generally. This may be a symptom of Snake's corneal edema, a swelling from fluid that normally the cornea keeps clear. This, according to richmondeye.com, can be caused by a number of things, from trauma to lens implants and keep that ladder in mind for when I finally reveal my theory about the eye droid in this game. Certain moments of great emotion seem in the Phantom Pain to sometimes at least give off a strange diamond glittering light. Now really this seems to be caused by a trick of the light as rays hit our eyes just at the right time. But little flourishes like these bring us into the character of Snake and the scene, physically as well as psychologically. There are a ton of other strange subtle light distortions that will also just have to wait. But I'll point out, for now, the flashes that seem to occur when Miller says lost, and when we first lay eyes on Mother Base, as examples. I'm gonna make him give back our past. 
take back everything that we've lost. And I won't rest until we do. Ocean Mother Base! I don't know how long it'll take. But I'll make it bigger. Tell me like you used to. When Snake does finally speak, it's the first time he seems to fully accept the role of Big Boss since awakening in Cyprus. But consider that his first words are asking Kaz to tell him what to do, something that the real Snake would likely never do. And yet, from these lines to the flashbacks that both bookend this scene, it appears as though we really do remember, at least to some extent, life as Snake nine years ago. But the signs that this is not the true Big Boss are already here. This is a gentler Big Boss, a meek and mild, a Christ-like Big Boss, separated from all his evil traits, not unlike, perhaps, two certain clones that split Snake's DNA along supposedly dominant and unexpressed genes. Evil Big Boss, as it were, in this game, is the real one. In the Phantom Pain, good and evil are not opposites, they are secretly connected at the hip as part of the same organization, as part perhaps of the same individual. Moving on to the next scene in episode 2, we finally arrive on Mother Base. Now this is a long shot, but just hear me out. Back in the beginning of Ground Zeroes, when XOF departed Cuba for Mother Base, we saw them riding in four different choppers. But at the end of the game, on Mother Base, I could only count in total three. Likely the fourth one, containing Skullface, presumably never actually made it to the offshore plant. He makes some eerily cryptic remark to this effect in Chico's tapes about how, even if he doesn't get to meet Big Boss in person, he'll at least get a good look at Big Boss's body. This has all sorts of implications that, again, we'll just have to wait for my next entry in What the Fuck Happens in Metal Gear Solid about Ground Zeroes. The point for now, though, is this. The three helis that we saw attacking Mother Base, and then the three choppers we keep seeing in this scene, they might be a reference to each other. A sort of recursion, a, a repetition. After all, we may be pawns, not only in Zeroes and Big Boss's conspiracy, but Skullfaces as well. We may be, in other words, one of Skullface's Trojan horses that he mentioned at the start of Ground Zeroes. And this nod to the three choppers from Ground Zeroes may be foreshadowing that fact by way of a callback. Note also the same shot of the choppers outside echoes the one inside Skullface's ride back during Ground Zeroes. This not only drips with delicious irony and portend, it conveys the bizarre and unique way that the Phantom Pain plays with the series' past, present, and future controlling the future by controlling memories of the past, controlling the past by in turn controlling the present. And all of that of course is a nod to Orwell. Miller looks not only recently tortured, but sick. His is a fever that will not for the majority of the game abate, a disease of both body and brain. But notice the bloodstains and grime on Miller's body. They look pretty similar to how he looked at the end of Ground Zeroes. As he says, it's like he's still there, that trauma has never relented. Here's another example of something subtle to the visuals that serve double meanings. Whether or not the choppers and ours are really meant to recall XOF or not, there's little debate that this scene at large is meant to recall the events of Ground Zeroes, at least in general. Think about it. The last time Snake and Miller were in a chopper together over Mother Base, it was nine years ago in the Caribbean. So as much this new mother base is arranged as if to be ahead of us in both space and time, going back to that Ingsoch slogan from Orwell's 1984, in double thing fashion, at the same time, it's also a kind of return to our past, or at least one interpretation of it. But remember, this isn't the real big boss. That memory of the past, that truth record, that interpretation is a lie. But it's the first of many necessary to implant in our protagonist, Venom Snake. It's crucially Orwellian that, to command and control his subconscious, 
to steer him towards acts in the future, the thought police, so to speak, behind the phantom pain must first take over his memories. And with his, ours. Hey. That was some operation we had, huh? Nine years ago. Carving out our own world. Making our own future. And they took it away. We were dogs, all right. Slinking around, out of sight for sight. Digging up whatever kind of dirty money we could find. You name it. We did it. You see this? Diamond dogs. Our new home. Our sense of who we are and where we came from are thereby rendered by the game as something rooted in a past that's only as accurate as our present memories are as living, fallible human beings. And notice also, as we close out this scene, the shadow that makes Miller look almost like he's wearing a hook for a hand, not unlike a pirate from the days of the American Revolution. This may be also a tacit nod to Captain Ahab from Melville's Moby Dick, who has many similar dramatic moments spent crying for revenge just like this. As we arrive, we can hear sirens. We'll hear these again when quiet appears. They seem to announce to the entire base, all hands on deck. In this case, it seems to be because Miller will need immediate medical attention. And this, of course, foreshadows the existence of a medical team, who will grow into a separate secret unit by the end of the game, the research team. These will be the Diamond Dogs, whose infections with a mutated strain of Parasite will trigger the events that lead not only to Shining Lights even in death, but to a quiet exit, and the conclusion of the game. The appearance of a medic team here also foreshadows, of course, the very end reveal of Venom Snake's former identity as an MSF medic. Or at least that's one way of looking at things. As Snake steps out and helps Miller to his feet, the camera pans down to show how tall Kaz can stand just by propping himself against us as his crutch. This of course is loaded with symbolic irony. Then Kaz launches into his second monologue, this time on how much things have changed. For the past nine years without you, he's implying, Diamond Dogs believed in nothing. The organization merely lived off war, biding its time, almost in a sort of coma, doing whatever minor damage or causing whatever trouble for Cypher they could, but waiting for your return. And now with Snake as their leader, Diamond Dogs can awaken from its coma and achieve its true raison d'etre, revenge. However, here's a crucial and very subtle detail about this scene. As Kaz is speaking, and all our attention is on him, if we look really close, we can see tiny particles of something in the rotor wash from the helicopter. At the end of each line, at Cypher and Revenge, while all our attention is on cause, Snake sniffles. Things have changed, boss. We pull in money, recruits, just to combat Cypher. Rubbing our noses in bloody battlefield dirt. All for revenge. Something in the air, it seems, doesn't agree with his body, an allergen, particles that may in time breed illness. Yet again, we're operating on both levels here, the literal and metaphorical. Yet again, words, you might say, are becoming, in the phantom pain, flesh. But who can say for sure if this allergen is meant to mean something more? For the plot, and not just for the themes. As cause continues, at And We Answer, Ocelot appears in frame. His jacket, a la MGS2, removed. His black Diamond Dog's armband visible for the first time. The black armband has been a fixture of this character from day one. In MGS1, 2, and 4, it supposedly represented his mourning for the loss of Big Boss. In MGS3, it was ostensibly mourning for the boss. 
But in five, it may be Ocelot mourning the preordained death of you, Venom Snake. Who knows? Things have changed, boss. We pull in money, recruits, just to combat Cypher. Rubbing our noses in bloody battlefield dirt. All for revenge. The world calls for wet work, and we answer. No greater good. No just cause. Cause continues, saying that Cypher has given them no choice but to depart from good and right and moral ideals completely. And it's here that key imagery is introduced. Imagery of demons, Satan, and hell. You'll remember that going back to MGS2, Solidus called his unit in Liberia where Raiden fought as a child soldier, the army of the devil. In MGS1, Raven said that Snake fights like a demon in battle, and so on. This imagery is no stranger to this series. But even though this language has been around in MGS before, it's never been this thematically crucial. Snake says he's already a demon, that heaven isn't his kind of place anyway. This, of course, among other things, teases that we have been cast out of the real Big Boss's new entity, Outer Heaven, only to join it as its mere figurehead, its phantom, by the events of the original Metal Gear, which will follow, chronologically, the events of this game. The Phantom Pain plays with both Eastern and Western traditions of the word demon here, though, as Snake is both a Judeo-Christian demon and a Japanese-style Oni, a former human being too terrible to be rehabilitated who transforms into a hideous monster instead, according to the Shinto Japanese folklore. As the Diamond Dogs bring Miller his crutch, Kaz violently pushes the Diamond Dog away, groaning from the effort needed to stand on his own. This conveys his emotional state not only in this scene but throughout the game, walking wounded, a misanthrope who refuses to build any more genuine relationships or lead a genuine life ever again, turning instead completely inward to lick eternally his narcissistic wound. A man who, as I said, has already on some level resigned to die. Yet Kaz is still an incredibly complex and compelling character. Even now, broken and weary, he musters the sheer strength of will to summon more of that electrifying passion and intensity from before, gripping his fist yet again while declaring, you're not sleeping and we're not junkyard hounds, we're diamond dogs. But for all its intensity, yet again this declaration is mere opium, a fantasy to dull the pain, evident by the oxygen mask that immediately follows it. But before they put Kaz under, presumably for surgery, where he'll receive the first regimen of what is almost certainly parasite therapy, which throughout the course of the game we'll see transform his eyes and heighten his senses, Ocelot permits Kaz to continue brainwashing you, or as he puts it, talk. But unexpectedly, it's here that Venom Snake's true personality, to the extent that he has one, starts to shine through. Like the boss before him, perhaps, Snake wants not so much to take back his stolen past in revenge as safeguard a future, build a world worth fighting for, so that his sacrifices and suffering actually in the end means something. By the end, as the torch will be passed from Big Boss to the player ourselves, he too believe his sacrifice will change the world. We too will be implored to find this inner big boss within and change the world according to our own interpretations, to live for something unlike Miller, greater than ourselves. I'm big boss, and you are too. Now, he's the two of us together. Where we are today, we built it. This story, this legend, it's ours. We can change the world and with it the future. I am you, and you are me. Carry that with you wherever you go. Thank you, my friend. From here on out, you're a big boss. One detail I have to mention is just how strange Ocelot's blocking is in this entire scene. Blocking is theater terminology for character placement. 
Now in case you're thinking this element of visual language isn't that important here, keep in mind that Kojima went to an insane degree of effort just to nail the blocking for this moment back in Ground Zeroes when the camera moved seamlessly through the crowd of XOF. This stylistic register of MGS5 is one of its most compelling and unique aspects, namely its use of what look to be nearly nothing but single takes that play out almost like blocked ballet in real time. The blocking freaking matters in this game, and the blocking here with Ocelot is very and intentionally weird. Ocelot, who has basically no words through this entire sequence, steps right into the path of sight so that he disappears for a moment, first behind Miller, then behind Snake, and then he remains for most of the scene as well as silent, completely motionless, almost like a sleepwalker. He only takes a single step and it's while our focus is on Miller, so we probably won't even notice that Ocelot's moved at all. Ocelot remains throughout this scene a literal as well as perhaps symbolic wedge between Snake and Miller. His totally blank expression couldn't contrast more with Miller's passionate fury. Yet despite Ocelot's centrality to the visual way that this scene is conveyed, he completely fades into the background otherwise, something this character was incapable of doing in every game before. Yet Ocelot, as we eventually find out, is the real XO here, Big Boss's real number two. His strange centrality to the geometry of the scene seems to foreshadow, perhaps, his similarly deceptive centrality to the events of the wider entire game. Well, that about does it for this episode. With 30,000 views in the first two weeks, we'll continue on with the next part of the cutscenes of MGSV. Until next time, boss. Yeah.